Wrexham have just been promoted into the Football Leagues and there's one question on everyone's lips and that is, when can we expect them in the Premier League? And I thought, you know what, let's dig into the data. And so what I've done is I've gone through all of the teams who've moved from the fourth tier up to the first tier within the Premier League era. So that's since 1992-93 season. And here they are. These are all of the teams who've been promoted from the fourth tier up to the Premier League in that time. Now, as a caveat, during that period, some of the names of the leagues have changed. So what I'm gonna do in this video is refer to tiers. So fourth, third, second, and first tier. Now, there's a few interesting things to notice here. You can see there's only five teams who took longer than 20 seasons to get into the Premier League. And of these teams, four of them are quite interesting. That's the four teams with asterisks here. So we've got Bradford, Reading, Burnley, and Brighton. Now, each of these teams didn't have a continuous upwards trajectory. Actually, what happened is they were relegated from the second tier into the third tier at some point, which accounts for the fact that it took them longer than 20 seasons. We do have Barnsley here who got promoted in 97-98. They're quite impressive because they actually didn't have a relegation. They simply went up the divisions and took forever to get out of some of them. And speaking of teams who took forever to get somewhere, we've got Wolves here who actually got through the first two tiers of their promotions quite quickly and then spent forever in the championship. So they sit between the teams who took more than 20 seasons to get promoted and the rest of the teams who took less than 15 seasons to get promoted. But what we learned from this overall data set is that it's going to take you about 14 seasons on average to get from the fourth tier to the first tier in the Premier League era and actually there's a really interesting weighting to that time frame because most teams don't spend that much time in the fourth tier so only 3.4 seasons in the fourth tier in the third tier you're looking at about 4.5 seasons before you're getting promoted and then the second tier 6.4 seasons to get out of the championship so there's definitely a skew towards getting out of the championship but obviously the owners of Wrexham aren't thinking in terms of a 20 year time frame they want to get up to the Premier League much quicker and that means quick promotions and there are some teams in our data set who've managed to do that quite quickly so we've got Luton here that many people will know from the Premier League this season who managed to jump quickly from the fourth third into the second tier and they weren't that long before they were in the Premier League as well so the big question is can we learn anything from those teams who manage these quick promotions so on the board in front of me here we boiled it down to all of the teams who took less than 10 years to make the promotion through tiers three and then two up into the Premier League and there are some standouts here particularly the teams who've managed it in five seasons or fewer. So we have two teams that managed it in four seasons, that's Fulham in 0102 and then Hull in 0809. And then more recently, we've got a couple of teams who managed it in five seasons, that's Bournemouth in 1516 and then Luton, as we've said, who managed it last season. So what lessons can we learn from these teams who got quick promotions? Well, let's begin with Fulham because Fulham got promoted in 0102, but they had been bought out by Mohamed Al Fayed in 1997, which is at the very beginning of this process. He puts a lot of money into the club and that money helps them get to the Premier League very quickly. The same is true of Hull. They had a couple of takeovers in the early 2000s, which allowed them to put a bit more money into their team. And again, that translates into very quick promotions as well. And so obviously money can be very helpful if you're looking to get your team promoted quite quickly. It is worth mentioning that Hull did have Phil Brown as the manager in this period. And so good management along with a bit of money to help you along is a really nice recipe for success at getting your team promoted. Now, if we come to Bournemouth and Luton, they don't necessarily have great financial backing, but what they do have is a really nice blend of good management and consistent play style, which carries them up the divisions. And so with Bournemouth, we have Eddie Howe getting them promoted into the third tier. He does leave, he goes to Burnley and comes back, and then he gets them promoted again into the championship and carries them up into the Premier League. So even though he's gone for a season, you still have that continuity over this stretch carrying them up into the Premier League. Similarly with Luton, the manager who carries them through the divisions is Nathan Jones, but again, he does leave. Actually, he gets them promoted into the third tier. He then leaves and it's left to Mick Harford to get them into the championship. But then Nathan Jones comes back. He has them on a promotion trajectory. And then he leaves again to go to Southampton, handing over to Rob Edwards, who similarly retained the same play style at the end of that season to get them into the Premier League as well. So despite the fact there's a lot of chopping and changing, there is still that blueprint that carries them all the way through the divisions. So money and management are the two key things here. So let's have a look at Wrexham to see how they compete on both fronts. So let's start with money first. And the good news is, is that Wrexham are really well placed to do well in the fourth and the third tier because both of those divisions are ruled by the salary cap management protocol which is a really fancy way of saying there's a salary control and what that looks like is that you can only spend a certain amount of your revenue on salaries in the fourth tier you can spend 55 percent of your revenue on salaries and in the third tier you can spend 60 percent of your revenue on salaries now as we can see from the data in front of me here this hasn't actually been happening in recent seasons and that is because of covid so as you can see here in the fourth tier in 2021 actually the wage to turnover ratio was up at 80 percent that means 80 percent of a team's revenue was being spent on wages which 
which as you can imagine, is not a particularly sustainable way of living. But as you can see in the following season, they've managed to get below that 55% threshold, which is what Wrexham will be expected to do as well. But this won't pose any problems for Wrexham because they're so good at generating revenue. So in the first season of Welcome to Wrexham, we have Sean Harvey, the CEO, saying that their wage budget for the year is around 2.3 million pounds. Now, since then they have renegotiated some contracts, so that figure is now thought to be closer to 2.5 million. But if we think about it in terms of a 55% wage to turnover ratio, then Wrexham only have to make around five million pounds for that to work. And actually, in terms of our best estimates based on the last year, Wrexham are much more likely to be up closer to about 10 million pounds in terms of revenue, which gives them around 5.5 million pounds worth of wage budget to play with, which is much higher than the season before, all of which suggests that Wrexham are fine because they're making so much revenue that they're gonna be able to cover the costs of their wage bill. If they make it to the third tier, that's gonna add another half a million to their wage budget, even if their revenues don't increase. And so again, they're probably likely to be fine in that instance, but that brings us to the championship, which as you can see is a nightmare when it comes to wage to turnover ratio. 2021, that was up at 126%. That means that on average, most teams are spending more on their player wages than they're getting back in revenue, which is not a recipe for sustainable football club running. As you can see, those figures are coming down, but it is still very high and a big reason for that is that the championship doesn't come under the same squad cap management protocol that the other two tiers do. Instead, the championship is regulated by FFP, which are probably a bunch of letters that you have heard before, because that is the same principle that is applied in the Premier League. Now, the FFP rules for the championship are that you have a three-year window, and each window you can make five million pounds worth of loss. So that's a total of 15 million pounds over that three-year window. Now, there is provision to go up to 13 million pounds worth of loss every year, as long as your owners are putting money money in for that loss. So that means in total, you can make losses of up to 39 million pounds a year in the championship over a three year window. And what that means is there's a lot of teams in the championship who are operating at very high levels of loss. So this is a list of profit before tax for the championship clubs in the 21-22 season. And as you can see, the majority of those clubs are actually losing money. Now we do have a couple of teams here that have made a lot of money, but it's worth noting that the figure for Stoke actually includes exceptional items and they were actually operating at a loss of around 39 million, which puts them right down here in the pack. The championship is a brutal league from a financial perspective and if you get stuck in there for a while, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. And to illustrate that, we've just got a chart here which shows you how much money was thrown into championship clubs in a 10 year stretch that ended in 21-22. As we can see, Fulham hands in away the biggest spenders here, pushing 750 million pounds spent over that period. We also have QPR over the 250 million pound mark as well, but still a load of clubs here spending well over 100 million pounds in a bid to get to the Premier League. And the reason why you might make that bid is because the Premier League is very lucrative. So if you get into the Premier League, even if you get immediately relegated, you're gonna make an estimated 170 million pounds from three seasons, which is obviously a massive pot of money, and that is what those owners are chasing. But if a promoted side can survive in the league for even one year, then the projected financial benefits are massive as well, because as soon as that happens, they're then entitled to a greater tranche of the parachute payments, which means over five seasons, they're projected to earn around 290 million pounds. Again, a massive chunk of money, and that is the pot of gold that many of these owners are chasing after. So how much will it cost for Wrexham to make it from the fourth tier up into the Premier League? Well, we handed this problem to TIFO's financial expert, Abhishek Raj. He crunched the numbers and he came back to us with a few estimations. So he estimates for Wrexham to get from League Two to League One, it's gonna cost around $10 million. The same again from League One to the Championship, but once you get to the Championship, those costs rocket right up. So he reckons that once you get to the Championship, the cost of getting into the Premier League is then gonna be around 150 to $200 million. Now I've included these figures in dollars because the owners of Wrexham are American. Now those owners are in fact right Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhenney, who are very famous actors in the United States, I'm told. Which is good news when you're in the National League because they have a lot of money, but relatively to the championship, they do not have a huge amount of money. Actually, we've estimated that their value together is around $400 million. If you make it to the championship, it's then gonna cost you $200 million on average to get out of that league, and that actually accounts for around 50% of the net worth of these two guys. And so if they are gonna get out of the championship, the odds are they're gonna have to try and find money 
money from somewhere else. But that's not a problem either because they have access to resources that most other clubs at that level simply do not have. And that's where the Disney Plus series comes in because these owners won't just be asking for investment, they'll be offering something themselves, exposure. And this is why massive corporations like TikTok or United Airlines are willing to sponsor a team who are in League Two because you're not just paying for a name on a shirt, you're paying for a name on a shirt which is appearing on a global TV series. And the potential benefits here are exponential because the further up the divisions that Wrexham go, the more appealing that sponsorship is going to be and so they'll attract bigger and more lucrative sponsorship deals. So when it comes to money, Wrexham look to be really well set to make it up to the Premier League without any hitches. But as we said, there are two aspects that are really impactful when it comes to getting promoted to the Premier League and the second one is management. So on the board in front of me, I've got what is probably Wrexham's best 11 going into this season and that team is fronted by these excellent forward players in Paul Mullen and Ollie Palmer, who you'll know well if you have watched Welcome to Wrexham. But they're not the only stars here. We've got James McLean, who's a former Premier League player who's come in in the summer, and Stephen Fletcher as well, also a Premier League player who's come in this summer. And there's some excellent players as well across the pitch. So Elliot Lee, for example, who's a really important cog for them in the heart of their midfield. And so in many respects, this is a team who would be comfortable playing at a higher level, which bodes well for Wrexham's future. But that doesn't mean to say that they do this at the expense of the tactics. So they do have a very direct style. They like to try and build up from the back particularly through the wide areas, to try and then get the ball into the box to their star forwards. But if their attempts at building out the back aren't working, then they still have the option of going long to someone like Oli Palmer, who's quite a tall forward, who can then play the ball off into Paul Mullin or into the midfielders, and they can generate chances in that way. So they can play quite a direct style of play as well. But the problem becomes that you can sometimes become too reliant on your star forwards to generate chances, and all you end up doing is getting the ball into the box for them. For example, you may have seen a lot of people talking about the fact that Ben Toza, who was one of the centre-backs has a massive throw on him so he can get the ball from these long throw situations into the box, into Palmer and Mullen and they will often score in that way. And obviously set pieces will be a dangerous source of goals as well. Why might this be a problem? Well to quote Juan Malio, the faster the ball goes forward, the faster it can come back. So if you play a fairly direct style then you can expect those games to become quite transitional. The ball will go backwards and forwards and you will lose control and control is very important when you're playing at the highest level. And if you add to this the fact that Wrexham's press is quite passive, what this means is that often there are periods of play where the opposition are able to hold the ball and actually manipulate it as well. Earlier this season Wrexham lost 5-0 to Stockport and that was a game which really typified that. Stockport were able to control the ball for fairly long periods and just ended up chipping away at Wrexham until they got the goals. And so in the long run the best way for Wrexham to compete at the highest level is by adopting a bit more of a controlled approach. And actually this is reflected in the data when we look at the teams who are promoted to the Premier League. So on the board in front of me I've got a graph from Opta which just shows play style of the various teams who've been promoted to the Premier League since 16-17 season. On the x-axis here we've got passes per sequence, so the teams making more passes in their possessions are going to be towards this end of the spectrum, and lo and behold we've got Burnley here from last season. And then on the y-axis we've got direct speed upfield, and so the faster the team the higher they're going to be on the graph. And so we can see we've got Cardiff and Luton here who are slightly outliers, they're playing more direct football. The majority of teams who are making it to the Premier League are towards this more slow and intricate, this more controlled approach in this bottom corner here. This season Wrexham would appear on the graph around this area here so they're not a million miles away from that more controlled approach but it is worth remembering that they are playing in League 2 and once they get to the championship that could change drastically if they're still trying to play that direct play style. So the big question is how sustainable is this tactical approach in the long run? Because if they get to the championship and they decide that their style isn't sustainable then it will require them bringing in a new manager, rebuilding the squad and that could add a number of years to their projections for promotion to the the Premier League. So from a financial point of view it seems clear that Wrexham are well set up to fly through the divisions and get through to the Premier League. They may even do it in record timing. But on the other hand there is that nagging doubt about the way that they play football. Will it be sustainable all the way through the divisions? And if it isn't how many years will it add on to their time up through the divisions? So with all of that taken into account we're looking at a best estimate of between 7 and 10 seasons before we see Wrexham in the Premier League playing sustainable Premier League football. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.